His name is Phyllis, passed away yesterday. And so you want to remember the Powell family. Uh, and if you need their address, if you want to send a card or anything, I put a note on the back table with their new address. They've moved in the last year or so, or less than a year. And so their new address is on the back table if you need that for any reason, uh, to send them a card or anything. I also want to welcome those who haven't been here in a while. In particular, I'd like to think of Ruben Soto, who is here today. Ruben has not been here. He's had a tough winter. So Ruben, we're glad to have you here today, Ruben, buddy. Other announcements, uh, we will be uh, celebrating the Lord's table tonight. And we'll have our prayer time also, and that will be at 5 instead of 6. So make a note of that, 5 o'clock tonight, not 6 o'clock. So come for that. Uh, choir, please be here about quarter till or so, if you wouldn't mind. Other announcement is our annual congregational meeting will be held tomorrow. Uh, there was, we were, we'd try to reschedule, we thought about rescheduling because they called for cold weather, but then they changed the forecast so drastically, we said we'll just leave it where it is. So tomorrow night... We will have our congregational meeting. You're encouraged to be here. Those folks are uh, head of departments. I'd ask you particularly to be here so that you can share some of your ministry with us to let us know what's going on and your needs that you may have in your ministry. So please try to be here if, if at all possible. But you're all welcome. You're all encouraged. We, we, we highly would encourage you to come to this meeting. It's a good thing to see what's all involved in our church and what's all going on here. Other announcements, I don't have any of those. You see the rest of them in your bulletin. Take, take note of those as you can. Any other announcements that I perhaps missed? All right, for our, prayer, or for our call to worship this morning, I'm going to be turning to uh, Psalms 84. Last week we talked a little bit about heaven, and today our session, our music package is almost a backup, if you will, a continuation, if you will, of that, what we sang last week. It's just the way that it worked out. It wasn't necessarily intended that way, but it's the way it is. And in Psalms 84, I want to read verses 1 to 4 and then read verses eight or 10 to 12. Psalms 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where, shall, where she may lay her hit young. Even your altars, O Lord, host, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They, shall, they will still be praising you. And then verses 10 through 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. That's the name of the first song we're going to be singing this morning. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace to the glory and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. When you read this and you hear these, vo these words, what does it stir up in you? Does it stir anything up in you in your heart of when you hear words like this? Be praising. It says in verse 1, how lovely is God's tabernacle. Could God's tabernacle could be this tabernacle, which we share today. It could be this tabernacle where the Spirit resides. Or it could be his heavenly tabernacle where God resides and where one day we will be with him. In verse 2, it says, my soul longs for you. You find times in your life when things are going and you just long for God. You long to be in his presence. You long to be with him. It's just such a hurting time in your life that you long to be out for him. And then verse 11, it says, God is a sun and a shield. I believe when we get to heaven, God will be the light of heaven. It's referring to God's light, his sun. And he will be a shield. He'll be our protector. As he protect us today, he will protect us forever when we become in heaven, we come face to face with him. And the courts are a reference to heaven or his tabernacle or the church. Could be all three. I got a quote I found from a James Nesbitt in his church pulpit commentary. It says, the house of God is an anti, A-N-T-E room of heaven, an example. Or in other words, a bit of heaven on this side of heaven. God loves his house intensely. And if we do not love it, it is because we do not love God. The Bible gives more space to the erection of the tabernacle and the temple 
than to the creation of the world. And if you read your Bible or not, God spends more time talking about the tabernacle than he talked about the creation of the world. That's how important the church and the tabernacle is to God. And it also talks about the author saying here, he would rather be a doorkeeper in heaven than dwell in, de- in wickedness. He would rather be a servant than to dwell in all the riches of the wickedness and all that it may offer us and all that is available. He would still rather be a servant of God than to do that. Finally, Psalms 84 points out to Jesus who became, in a real sense, the temple of God. He is the ultimate dwelling place of God on earth, the Word made flesh. And that's who we worship this morning. When we come this morning, we're going to be singing songs this morning. It's going to talk about heaven. It's going to talk about being better in one day here, our love of God and how much he loves us and all that we have in Christ and that Jesus lives. It's kind of the th- songs that we'll be going through this morning. But as we go through it, remember what heaven, if one day we will be with God in heaven. Today we are with God in church. Today we are with our fellow members. Uh, Chris had a sermon about two weeks ago or so, and he talked about the importance of coming to church and being a church and being a church body. And that's part of what this is about, how important that is to be gathered together as God's church in his assembly place. And one day we will all be gathered together in his heavenly place, and we'll worship him in the holy heavenly tabernacle when we praise and worship him forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love to us. We thank you, Father, the provisions that you've made for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who became the temple on earth where your spirit resided and you brought and you declared our forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again and now dwells at the right hand of the Father. We thank you for that, Father. We pray now, Lord, as we bring our praises to you, we lift our voices to you, honoring, glorifying, lifting us up to you, Father, acknowledging that you are worthy to be worshiped and we worship you now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Stand with us if you would. Hold up, hold up. We have no words on the back table or back wall. Sorry about this. We don't have words. We're just going to sit up here and mumble. <laughs> well, we're going to, rather than hold up, we're going to turn around and look, get, ignore our backs, okay? Okay, go ahead, Dave.
is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out to you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. I taste it and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. To you. Better is one day in your course. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your course than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your course. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your course than thousands elsewhere. Than thousands elsewhere. It's our prayer that you would rather be here than probably any other place in God's court to dwell with God's people. Our next song, the chorus says, Unfailing love from heaven's throne that sought me out and brought me home. My song of praise shall ever be the Father's love for me. It's an unfailing love from heaven's throne that captures us, that draws us in. God on his throne loves us so much in heaven that he draws us to himself because he's the love of God. came my salvation to the Lord. I remember being a teenager and that song talked about if it had not been for God's love, I would not have come. I would not have felt the call. God called me. And I can remember being a rebel teenager and my parents trying to take me to Chinese school and Christian endeavor and wanted me to become a Christian. I wanted nothing to do with it. 
Matter of fact, they said, don't you want to become a Christian? I said, I don't want nothing to do with it. I did not want to be a Christian then. But then God started working in my heart. And within a year or so, I came to the point that I needed Christ, and I knew I needed Christ, and I thought, if I don't accept Christ as my Savior, I will be damned for, forever in eternal separations. And so because of that, Christ poured into my life, and he is all that we have now. He's all that I have. All I have is Christ, and that's all we really need. Amen. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, I would I no longer fear the grave. Christ has come, took away the sting of death. Through a saving blood, though my body fails and my flesh grows weak, till my final breath to this soul. Fall 
from this earth we go right into eternity and we just thank you for that thank you for this day bless the service lord god and let's just touch our hearts we just thank you for everything in your name amen and dave buchanan has graciously but with a twisted arm agreed to come and share his testimony with us uh, if you don't know, Dave is, mar is married to Mary, Mary Jawson, and Mary Jawson is the daughter of Todd Jawson, so that makes him the son-in-law of Todd Jawson. Have I got that right? All right, Dave, come on up. Share with us what God's laid in your heart. Thank you. It's just like, I don't know, it just feels weird. But I just want to share my testimony with you guys. Um, try not to read from here. But I was I was born into uh, a God God fearing and God loving family. I, my parents have always served the Lord my whole life. Um, I know it wasn't like that before me and when they were young. Um, but I was truly blessed to grow up in a family that just loved the Lord. Uh, I grew up in church uh, from infancy and just I was always surrounded by it. But you know we know that doesn't that doesn't save you. Um, and then my my story of God's mercy and power and healing just started when I was four and a half years old, right around Penny's age. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, my family has an automotive business, and um, I've always been there. I've always hung out, always hung out with the, guy, the workers there. And one day, my mom and I, when I was four and a half years old, we stopped by. We had went, to, went and saw a movie, uh, Cop in Half. I remember the movie. And then we went to go to Taco Bell. And then we went to the shop to see my dad. And uh, one of his employees was just, you know, just we were having fun. He was throwing, throwing me up in the air like everybody does with a small child. They just love it. They get a rush out of it. And uh, while well, this guy was like six foot five and uh, the shop's like all concrete, well, he was throwing me up in the air. And the one time I, I had like arched my back and he missed me and I just hit the pavement and I was lifeless. And like, that was like any parent's worst nightmare. Like when your employee comes beating on the door saying your, your child's not moving. Um, so they rushed me to the hospital. This was Sharon Hospital. And the doctor there, who's a, a godly man, Dr. Charlton, he, his wife actually was my um, first grade teacher. But he said, this is beyond what we can handle. So they life laid me to Pittsburgh. What had happened is I hit the, hit the ground, um, skull fracture, uh, brain swelling, bleeding. Um, actually, I had to drill a hole in my head and relieve, to, to relieve the pressure. And uh, 
they put me in a drug-induced coma for six days. I couldn't move because they didn't want to do any damage to the brain. Um, and through all of this, the doctors told my parents, they were like, you know, if your son does pull through this, he, he won't be able to function and talk and walk and all kinds of stuff. So they like, just prepared him for the worst. Well, 10 days, 10 days after that accident, we walked out of the hospital. I can imagine my parents telling this story, but um, God's good. And uh, two months after that, doctors gave me a 100% uh, percent clean bill of health. And I continued to just love the Lord. And then I hit high school and started, like, my desires for the world just started, you know, just living for the world. And I just remember, I'm not even reading this. I don't even know why I'm flipping the pages. But um, it's a security blanket. But I just remember one day, you know, standing in church and uh, during worship. I can't even tell you what song it was. But I just remember, I just remember the Lord, just the Holy Spirit just like convicting me of living how I was living when I knew how to live. I was brought up in how to live. And uh, so the Lord just, he just like penetrated my heart. The Holy Spirit just like started working on me. And just slowly the, my desires that I had for this world were stripped away. And he gave me new desires and new friendships and godly friendships. And I've, I've grown up loving music, and he, uh, he's like, he, he knew what he was doing. He let a friend of mine give me his old guitar, and I had no idea how to play music. So I started YouTube and stuff and playing music, and through a series of friends and everything, they were like, hey, you know how to play, play music? And I'm like, not really. I'm like, been playing for like three months. He's, and they were like, well, we're going to start up like a worship, praise and worship night at our church on Thursdays, would you mind leading worship? I'm like, yeah, sure, because I have a hard time saying no. And I'm like, why, why did I even say yes? I don't even know how to play music or sing, and let alone like talk in front of people. I was like in college, I was like a nervous wreck talk, doing speeches. But God just really poured into my life, and he gave me, he, I can take no credit for this guitar or singing. It's, it's only a God-given talent, and he's using me um, for that, and I just just so thankful um and just throughout my life like that accident and everything that I've been through like looking back it's like wow god you have been in control even when we didn't even know it so um but yeah that's my little testimony so thank you guys Thanks, Dave, for sharing that. Praise the Lord. Uh, prayer time today. If you would uh, get in your bulletin, take out your uh, prayer request that we have in here. I'm going to highlight a few. I'm going to add a few. Uh, you can see our ongoing prayer needs here. Uh, and then right below that, you can see uh, pray for those who are dealing with the COVID. There's another one I wanted to add to this. came in this week is... Uh, Cam uh, Cianci, he's, uh, he's on a ventilator in Pittsburgh, so pray for him. Uh, Marty Johnson is home, and he's doing well. And also, too, keep praying for Reuben. Reuben is here today, but he's still experiencing some pain, so keep him in, in your prayer, please. Uh, and then another one is uh, Ray and Marge Weiss's grandson. His name is Coda. He's... Uh, He's had some neck surgeries, and he may have to have another one, too. So keep them in prayer, please. Um, let's see what else do we have. Um, our missionaries, uh, especially ones in the Far East and all the uh, unrest that's going on in, in, in the Far East there, keep them in your prayers, too. And uh, make it a I mean, daily habit to uh, pray for all of our missionaries, too. We support many of them, so keep them in your prayers, if you would. Uh, also, uh, Todd Roberts, this is Pearl Reed's nephew. He has a damaged spine. <clears throat> and then also, too, let's keep uh, Tracy Powell and uh, that family away with the passing of her mom. So, 
That's all I have. Does anybody else want to add anything to this? Mr. Haller? Hank. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's pray for Hank. This is uh, Bill Haller's friend. And uh, just pray that uh, God will keep reaching out to him and, and he will uh, listen. Right? Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, okay. Uh, this is uh, Kevin Lockhart's daughter, Jessie. Okay, they found a mass in her breast, so pray for that. Okay, uh, bow your heads and uh, join me in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we do love you and we do praise you. and We thank you that we can come to you. We can come to the one you, Lord, that's created the universe. You've created everything that there is. It all comes from you. You have no beginning, you have no end. But you created this world for your glory, Father, and we are in it. And we are grateful and thank you for that. You control everything. Nothing can happen without you knowing what's going on. And you allow things to happen and you control it all, Father. And you do it all for a reason. And uh, we know that you do love us and you care for us and you provide for us. And we are so grateful and so thankful for that, Father. And, uh, and also, too, in this sinful, fallen world, you, you gave us a way of uh, salvation, a way of redemption, and that is through your son, Jesus. And it is, it is because of Jesus and what he's done for us come into this world as a human and, a, and also God and live in a sinless life for us to be that perfect sacrifice that saves us from sin. The punishment that we should have had was transferred to you, Jesus, and we are thankful. We are grateful. We are, we are undeserving, but we do thank you. And you took all these sins to the cross, and there they were, they, were, uh, they were put to death. And then after that, you rose from the dead, and you defeated death, you defeated sin, and you did this for us. So we are grateful for that. We are very, very grateful. We are, we are so, so, so thankful. And Lord, and Lord, you know everything that goes on in our lives in this congregation, in the world. And uh, still you want us to come to you and uh, to talk with you, to ask you things. So that's where we're at today, Father. We're here, we're asking, we're pleading, we're begging with you. You know our list, you know our concerns. And we can bring them straight to you. And you hear them. And Father, we do know that if we pray and uh, you are, you will answer them in your will, in your will, you will answer them on, and for us, to, for your glory. Father, we just, uh, we just know that you are in control of these things and, and uh, no matter how you answer them, it is for us, it's because you love us. So I lift up this entire prayer list to you today. Each and every person, situation on this list, we just lift up to you. And we know that you, you hear our prayers, Father, and you will, you will act in this. And Father, too, I just want to pray for this church body, this body of believers that we have here. I just pray that our relationship with you will grow stronger and stronger. I just pray that disciples will be made and they'll go out and make more disciples, Father, to glorify you, Jesus. And Lord, too, I do pray that you would lift up godly men. Uh, lift up men that, to be godly, to uh, follow after you, to be bold, not give in to this world, not give in to the pressures of society, 
that they would just follow you. I pray the same for women too. Lift up godly women, please, Lord. And Lord, too, I just want to, I pray for the upcoming prayer meeting tonight, uh, the Lord's table. I ask your blessing upon that. Please be with this, uh, the rest of this service and all that goes on here, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Shall we please all stand and sing, Jesus Calls Us, indeed. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. Um, there's going to be play practice this evening for the children and adults and all who are going to be in the Easter sunrise play. That'll be at 5 o'clock as well. Kids, uh, welcome, and I want to remind you that uh, this, uh, this time of studying God's Word is for you as well. I'm very conscious of your presence here with us and glad you kids are here. Uh, let me urge you, young kids who are here, to follow along in your Bible. Uh, one of the best ways that you'll learn the Word of God is as the Word of God is opened up, not only are you hearing and seeing the preacher, that's why living uh, messages is important, but you're also looking at the Word. And what we do here uh, at our church is we study the Word of God. We we, we take it apart, we look at it, we try to uh, get its message as best we can. There's Bibles, if you don't have one, in the pews, those black Bibles. And uh, the page that we're going to be on today is page 1,264, if you wanted to look that up. 1,264, plus there's a lot of adults around here that would be more than happy to help you find that passage. So follow along in your, in your Bibles. Um, and kids, let me also urge you to do one more thing. Let me urge you to get a Bible, number one, and if you don't have a Bible, ask your parents to get you one, and if your parents won't get you a Bible, uh, come to us and we will get you a Bible. Uh, I don't assume that every kid in church comes from a home where parents would necessarily do that. So we will, we will get you a Bible. Get a Bible, kids. Uh, and. Um, Begin to memorize the books of the Bible. 
Start with the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, so that you can just memorize that and you can say that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Get, you memorize the books of the Bible. It'll be very good for you to do because then when the preacher says, turn to Acts chapter 9, you go, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. There we go. Shh, you can find it, okay? And once you get the New Testament done, then, then do the Old Testament. And that will help you uh, and follow along in the Word of God will help you. Um, the most powerful thing that ever happened in my life was when I became a Christian. Um, I was living way out on a farm. Uh, my friends and I didn't have uh, driver's licenses yet. We were too young. And uh, my friends didn't want to hang around me uh, when I became a Christian. And uh, so I was out on the farm alone but I had a Bible and I read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. And that had a huge impact upon my life even to this day. And so kids, the word of God is powerful. Get your Bibles, read your Bibles. If you need any guidance on where to read, we'll get it. Bring your Bible to church, open it up and follow along. And God will bless you. God will really bless you. Well, let's pray together. Father, help us, we pray, as we come to study your word and as we come to hear the voice of Jesus. And we just pray that that voice will speak to us uh, today, to us again in, in power. We pray that your spirit will come to us. And we pray that you will help us to, to be wise and to take our short lives and to fill them with service to you, love for you, that our lives would matter. There's a reason we're alive today. There's a reason we're on this earth. There's a reason we're actually in this county, in this township right now. There's a reason that we're in the place that you've placed us here. And we are here to serve you and to glorify you. And we pray that you will help us to be that. We pray that this church would be a place where you are exalted. Help us, we pray. Help us as we work through these things now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll notice the title of the sermon is The Problem of Wineskins. And I actually stole that title from a book that I read way back when I was in high school. And I don't even remember the author. But the book uh, was a very helpful book. It got, my, it got me thinking a lot about, about uh, this parable that Jesus is giving and about the, um, the, the different things that I've seen in my life. And I, I keep going back to that. And what I want to do this morning, and we're in Matthew chapter 9, what I want to do in, in, in this passage this morning is I want, I hope, I hope that by the end of this time, I'm, I want you to have a vision, a vision. The Bible says without a vision, the people will perish. A vision and that that, uh, and I hope that you will appreciate what God has done in your life, but in our lives at this moment, in this place, uh, here where we're at. I, I hope that that, I hope that that comes through. On this for you. So we're going to study the passage. It's a very simple passage. Kids, you'll be able to go home after church and tell your moms and dads all about this passage. Very simple. Jesus is teaching. He's going to give three kind of illustrations. They're very simple. And then we're going to do kind of an extended application for this. So you'll remember, if you look in Matthew chapter 9, uh, you'll remember uh, that Jesus, last week, we looked at verse 9 and uh, through verse 13, Jesus uh, goes to Matthew, calls Matthew, who's a tax collector, but as a tax collector, he's rich, and uh, sadly, because he ripped people off. And then Matthew has this big party, and so the food must have been really good. Um, there, was, there was wine, there was, it was, it was a, a, a nice digs, it was a good party. And so Jesus is at this party, and the Pharisees are asking, why does your, 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 your master eat with tax collectors? And Jesus then teaches them. And so this follows right after that. So look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Now these are the disciples of John the Baptist. Disciples of John the Baptist, they come to Jesus' disciples and they say, Why do we uh, fast often and the Pharisees fast often, but you guys don't fast? In fact, in fact, you guys party. <laughs> 
Okay? You go to Matthew's house and you eat caviar and you eat all kinds of expensive prime rib and, and you, you drink all this expensive wine and, and how come you guys are doing this and you live like this? And again, that's what people said about Jesus. Look over to chapter 11 and verse, uh, you know, verse 19. Jesus says, this is what is reported of me. Well, look at verse 18. For John came neither eating or drinking. Now, it's his disciples that are talking to Jesus now. And they say he has a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton. That's somebody, kids, who eats too much. A glutton and a wine bibber. That's somebody who drinks too much wine. A friend of, Jesus didn't eat too much or drink too much wine. This was lies that were being told about him. But this was the impression. He partied. A friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. We'll see if you turn back to 914, that's what's going on now. These guys are saying, hey, we fast all the time. We disciples of John the Baptist, we fast all the time. And the Pharisees fast, and they fasted several times a week. And your disciples, they don't, they don't fast. What's going on with this? Now, again, what we see here is a theological, uh, 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 their theology is coming out. And they're saying... For us, following God is, 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 is doing stuff and, and, and meriting and, and works and duty and fasting. And that's what we're about. And staying away from sinners and you're going to Matthew's house and, and you're eating and drinking. We fast, you don't. What's the deal? What's the deal? And so Jesus tells them what the deal is. Look at verse 15. Jesus said to them, can the friends of a bridegroom mourn? as long as the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus uses, it was a very common illustration in the Bible, a wedding. Now, think of, the, think of a wedding that you went to. Think of a, a fun wedding that you went to. And you went to the wedding, and the gr groom was there, and the bride was there, and everybody was excited, and, and they had the wedding ceremony, and then you went to the reception, and there was great food there and dancing and there was there was there was cake and 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 it was just a celebration everybody was having a good time jesus points to that sort of celebration and joy and says this is what's going on right now and, and, and if some guy was at a wedding and says we shouldn't be doing this we should be fasting right now there's too much overeating going on here stop dancing we'd say dude there's the door. Go out, it, you know, and get out of here. You know, you're 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 a bummer. Like you're 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 messing up this whole this whole joyful celebration. And that's what Jesus is saying. This is a joyful celebration time. Now, what's he talking about? Well, actually, here at this point, Jesus is describing something that, to use phrases like this, an epic has has come. A huge change has come. This is what we we call in theological terms. He's describing something eschatological, something having to do with the whole big plan of God. And basically what Jesus is saying is this, listen, listen, I have come to establish the kingdom of God. The old covenant's over. The new covenant has begun. This is, this is a time for celebration, and I am here. The bridegroom is here. And you know, there's this whole imagery of the Messiah and the bridegroom and his bride, and then it gets fulfilled in the, old, in the New Testament. Jesus is the head of the church, and the church is his wife, his bride, his people. He has come to save his people. He's come to, to, to cleanse them and to, and to institute a kingdom and to change the world and to bring the gospel and to bring the new covenant. And that's what Jesus is pointing to here. And he says, you know what? This isn't a time to be mourning and fasting. He says that time is, co is coming, and there he's obviously pointing to his crucifixion and, uh, and, and burial and such. There's going to come a time, but again, look at verse 15. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? I, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, am walking here on the earth. I'm saving, I'm teaching, I'm instituting the kingdom and such. This is not a time for fasting. That is going to come. This is a time for celebration. Then he tells them two more illustrations that kind of teach and draw this out. The first one is this. Look at verse 16. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. 
for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Very simple illustration. If you have a garment and it has a tear in it and you're going to patch it, you don't take a piece of cloth that has never been washed that once it washes and dries will shrink as cloth does. Because if you do that and you put that on here, it's going to shrink and the hole that you have is now going to be bigger because it's going to tear all of the sides off. Nobody puts an old, a new patch on an old garment or else the garment will be destroyed, okay? And the patch will be destroyed. Then he tells another illustration, that's verse 17. Again, very simple illustrations, very straightforward. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Now, when you make wine, the grapes are put in there and yeast may be put in or there's natural yeast there. And what happens is, is that yeast begins to eat up the sugars of the wine and, and, and give off carbon dioxide. And so it, it bubbles, it bubbles, it bubbles, it bubbles, it bubbles. And so when you, when you, if you take a newer wine that is still very much fermenting, you take that newer wine and you put it in a wineskin. Now, what's a wineskin? Kids, you know what a wineskin is? You know what a wineskin is? A wineskin is a, a goat or a, a, a sheep or something, where they've skinned the whole thing, into, including the, the legs, the legs are there, the feet are there, they skin the whole thing, take all the hair off of it, fix it in a certain way, and tie the, the feet and the leg, the, the arms and the legs, tie that all together so that it's basically one big water bag-like thing, one big water bag. And then they would pour wine into, down the neck. They would pour wine down the neck and then they would seal that. Now, this wine, new wine, is bubbling. It's expanding. It's, it's, there's bubbles coming up out of it. And, and it's, 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 it's a, a live, living thing. And good and new wineskins, they have the ability to stretch and absorb and to allow that to take place and such like that. Now, if you, when you get an old wineskin that you've used a lot, that wineskin dries out, gets brittle. Gets, it's not flexible like a new wineskin. It gets crackly and crunchy like that. And if you put the new wine in there and that wine starts to go like this, it's going to burst that wineskin. And when that happens, the wineskin is definitely ruined. And the wine is ruined because it all goes down on the, onto the ground. And Jesus says, therefore, if you have new wine, you need to put it in new wineskins. You need new wineskins to hold new wine. You need something that's flexible, something that moves, something that breathes, something that can handle the dynamic of a new wine. A dynamic of a new wine. Now, old wine, which is actually better wine because it's aged, but old wine has all fermented out now. There's no more of that bubbling going on and such. But new, and so you can, you can have that. The wineskins can get old holding older wine, and that wine's actually better. But new wine put in those old wineskins, it's moving, it's active, it's, it's young, it's, it's vibrant. And Jesus said that you can't put that or else you're going to destroy everything. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, once again, you need to realize, Jesus is looking at the Pharisees who are saying, oh, no, 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 you, you shouldn't go to Matthew's house. You should stay away from those tax collectors. They're sinners. They're wicked. No, no, no. We would never go to Matthew's house. We would never party like that. We are righteous and holy people. We only do, we only fast. We're sad all the time. We don't eat. We're fat. We fast. We, we give. We make, we tithe everything that we get from the, we come home from the grocery store and we pour our Cheerios out and we take a tenth of that and we tithe that. And then we take our coffee and we take a tenth and we tithe that. And that's what, that's what we do. We, we tithe. We, we, we suffer. We, we try to earn God's love. We're sad. We're, we're, we're downers. We're, we're bummers. And, and that's our religion. It's a religion of being down and bummers. And Jesus says, you try to take new wine and pour it into that, it's going to blow up. And that's what's going on here. I have come to bring life. I've come to bring grace. I've become, I've be, I have literally come to institute a religion of grace where God treats sinners not like, okay, here's the list, here's the list, and you better follow the list. And if you can get enough check marks off, then maybe you can earn your way to heaven and get to heaven. So start fasting, start staying away from people, start doing the right thing, get enough checklists, and you'll get to heaven. Jesus said, I've come to, change to, I've come to tell you that that's a perversion of what religion is. The true religion is God's grace towards sinners. And I have come to be the symbol of that because I came from heaven. 
I came from heaven and I've come down to earth and I've come to give my life and I've come to die for you. I've come to live and die as a sacrifice for sin so that forgiveness can be, forg can be offered to every single person in the world. I come to shed my blood. I come to bring a new kingdom. I come to bring the kingdom of God. I come to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, all kinds of transitions start happening. See the temple in Jerusalem? That's a temple made by men. That's going to be destroyed. I've come to start a living temple made with living stones, and I'm the cornerstone of it. I've come to the people would be born again. I have come to launch not a small, little, uh, enclosed religion in this little country called Israel. I haven't come to just do that. Israel, by the way, is small. It's the size of Pittsburgh to Erie. That's how small Israel is. I have come. That nation was raised up and chosen by God and used by God primarily as a light to the world and to bring Messiah. I have now come. And now I am now come to expand this, not to replace Israel, to expand this, to expand it into an international kingdom, a worldwide kingdom. The gospel is going to forth, go into all the world and offer the gospel of God's grace and God's love and God's forgiveness to everyone. And now the kingdom will be more than just Jewish. It will be Jews and Gentiles. It will be slave and free. It will be rich and poor. It will be of all race, all color, all tribe. I have come to start this new thing. And this new wine would blow out of proportion, would just blow to smithereens. Phariseeism. And, and, and all this closed, little-minded, judgmental religionism, all this little legalism, bam, it's going to blow it up like new wine would old wineskins. And so you can't put this new wine into old wineskins. So Jesus is announcing a revolution of a powerful new grace religion. Now, and so first of all, we should look at this text as epical eschatological, for those of you who have been studying eschatology with us. This is, this is life-changing. This is why we have in our Bibles Old and New Testaments. This is new covenant realities, new wine, the coming of the king in that sense. But let me ask you this. Well, not, no, let me not ask you. Let me, let me be bold enough, brave enough, brash enough, maybe ignorant enough to tell you. There's something also going on here with what Jesus is saying of an ongoing principle that I believe that he wants these, these uh, concepts of old cloth on new garments, old new wine, old, uh, old wineskins. He wants this principle to be, to, be, uh, to be understood because there's a general principle here. And here's the principle. It's the idea of, and you see this in the Bible often, renewal or salvation, health, decay, renewal. Health, decay, renewal. Health, decay, renewal. You see that in the scriptures. Does anybody know where you see that in the scriptures? I'm actually asking somebody to answer this question. I know we don't do this a lot in preaching. David. Huh? I can't say. David. 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 Now there's an individual example, and you do see that. If you see the life of David, you're going to see healthy times, decay times, healthy times, decay times. Very good. Yeah. The book, of Judges. the book of Judges. When you read the book of Judges, what happens? Israel goes along. God raises up a judge, and the judge is not a judge like this. The judge, by judge, it means sort of a pro prophet leader. <laughs> A leader. They don't. They don't have a government at that point. He's the. He's the prophet leader, or she is Deborah, and uh, and the judge brings righteousness and 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 blessing and and turns the people back to God and such. And then and then it says. And then after that, judge uh, uh, that judge passes on. Forty years, Israel goes back to worshiping idols, back to getting involved with the pagan cultures around them, back to being beat up by all their enemies, and then God raises up Samson, and then God raises up another one, and God raises up Gideon, God raises up Deborah, and brings renewal. And in the book of Kings, you'll see in the book of Kings, this king was a, a wicked king, he's Ahab, he's, he, he, he follows, he, he brings Baal worship and such, and then all of a sudden God brings up an Asa, or God brings up a Josiah, and God raises up a godly king, and brings 
brings the nation back. And, God, and so there's this renewal and decay, renewal and decay. And this happened after the Bible was completed. It happened in the history of the church. Many of us think of the Reformation, where the Reformation was a turning back to the Bible, turning back to God. This new wine came bursting forth, and all of a sudden, the old wineskins of Catholicism and the church as it was with all of its institutions got blown apart by this new wine coming in. Now, how do we apply all of this to ourselves, who we are right here, Crossroads Christian Fellowship Church in 2021 in this place? How do we apply this to ourselves? Well, first of all, what I'd like to do is two way, by, by two ways of application. One is I would like us to sort of appreciate what God is doing to bring us to this moment. God has actually done something to bring us to this moment as a church right now. And I'm going to try to show you that. And then I'm going to ask the question, how do we stay healthy so that we don't enter into decline and sort of an inflexible, dry, uh, wineskin approach? So let's begin, first of all, to appreciate who we are. As I said, there's this idea of, of renewal, decline, renewal, decline, renewal, decline. And, and after the New Testament is complete, we see this renewal decline sort of happen like this. The church goes along and begins to lose touch with the gospel, begins to lose touch with Christ, begins to lose touch with grace, and begins to institute works, legalism, Traditionalism, a going through the motions. The church as an institute becomes important and it becomes concerned with its power and concerned with its success and it becomes proudful and becomes self-confident. And then sin enters into the church. And then the Spirit of God moves and people start opening their Bibles and reading their Bibles. And what they read in there they begin to once again grasp the gospel and grace and Christ and justification. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Salvation isn't by doing what the priest says and fulfilling these obligations and holy water and candles and, and masses and, and this and that. Salvation is by grace, through Christ, through his blood. I don't have to sit there and whip myself and wear, and wear some kind of monk's uniform and fast myself almost to death in hopes that I would be good enough or climb St. Peter's Basilica and kiss each step and pray the rosary and kiss each step and pray the rosary and hope when I get to the top that I've done enough work so that God will say, no, wait a minute. Salvation is free by grace through Christ. The very Son of God came and died for me. I have eternal life. That's what life is about. And all of a sudden, a renewal starts. That you, you come back to grip with justification and what justification is. And it becomes, it becomes really exciting. And then people go back to the apostles and they look and they say, the church isn't cathedrals and buildings and guys with funny hats on and, and robes and things like that. It can't, the church is a living body of believers and saints. That's what it is. And the church isn't something that you're born into or you're into because you're, you're a citizen of some country. The church is something that you enter into by being born again. And baptism isn't something that you just start sprinkling all these, bapt all these children and saying, oh, now they're... No, no, no. Baptism is for a disciple, somebody who's, who's, who's committed themselves to Christ and has been born again. And that's what the church is. It's a group. It's a living body. It's a living, breathing new wine, as it were, of real believers who have committed themselves to Christ. And it goes on and on and on. They begin to, to become evangelistic, these people. They begin to, to be concerned about genuine, real holiness. Holiness isn't how many Hail Marys and this and that we can do. Holiness is of the heart. And it's loving God and loving man and living pure lives and living in gratitude to Christ and glorifying him. And this is a renewal movement. And they become concerned about how the church functions. Who is, who's to be head of the church? There are no priests in the New Testament. All believers are priests. There's elders, there's deacons, but there's no priests. All are priests. There's no cardinals. There's no bishops. There's no popes in that sense. And people become very servant-oriented. Historically, the church becomes concerned about the poor, about widows and orphans, about the sick. And the church becomes very, very diverse. 
black and white, brown and red, people together, people different life, people coming together. Why? Because they love Christ. They love Christ. And dear friends, this, these people then who begin to, to look at this Bible and begin to do it, the institutional church and sometimes the world looks upon them with great suspicion. Says, uh, I don't know. These people are separatists. These people are, are schismatics. That means they divide the church. These people are proud. They think they're holier than everybody else. And the devil just heaps all kinds of stuff on them. And dear friends, I want you to know that this has happened time after time after time, generation after generation after generation. I'm going to give you some examples. Just throw out some names. I'll give you some examples. You've all heard of St. Augustine, St. Augustine. And I was actually reading a biography of St. Augustine because I wanted to know more about St. Augustine. And then all of a sudden, I start reading about St. Augustine. Great guy, super guy. Uh, uh, no, no, no question about that. But then I'm really reading a huge chapter on how St. Augustine is going after these guys called the Donatists. And I said, oh, that, they must be bad. He's going after the Donatists. And then I start reading about the Donatists, and I realize, wait a minute. These Donatists were looking at the Catholic Church, and they were saying, your bishops, are cap your, your priests aren't holy. They get up out of bed from a prostitute and come in and, 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 and serve communion. What's that all about? He should be a holy man. And the, 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 the Catholic Church and, and, and Augustine said, no, 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 no. No, the church itself has the power to do this. And some of these bishops and priests, when persecution came, gave away the Bibles and, and had people arrested. And then they wanted to be priests again once Christianity, once the persecution ended. And the Donatists said, no, that ain't right. And the Donatists started embracing believer baptism. The Donatists started, they were the most uh, powerful expositors of the Bible. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting here reading, <gasps> I'm a Donatist. <laughs> I'd have been a Donatist. And it's true. God had begun to do this renewal movement amongst the Donatists and, then, and, and such. Fast forward, the Waldensians. You've never heard of the Waldensians, probably. But the Waldensians were these people that lived in, in Switzerland. They were a large group in Switzerland. And all of a sudden, Peter Waldo and others got a hold of a Bible, started reading it, and started saying, hey, everything we've been taught about religion is wrong. And they got back to the Bible, and they got back to worship, and they grasped the gospel again, and they began to worship, and they formed churches, and they separated themselves from the Catholic Church then. And the, and the Roman Catholic Church slaughtered them literally slaughtered them. Their children were being kidnapped, never to be seen again, so they could be rushed off into, to, to Rome and be raised as Catholics. And they butchered them, butchered them, men, women, boy, girl. And, and I started reading about the Waldensians and I said, wait a minute, I'm one of these guys. I would have been these guys. John Huss, John Huss, the Slovak, Slovak, Czechoslovakia, John Huss rises up and says, wait a minute, guys, salvation is by grace, justification is from the Lord. He starts opening up the Bible. They burned him. Wycliffe in England, he starts, he says, wait a minute, guys, the, the Bible teaches this. There's the Pope, there shouldn't be a Pope, should, we need to be, they burned him too. Then Martin Luther, Zwingli, John Calvin. They start studying, and they start to bring, they bring about this glorious reformation. But they didn't go far enough. They still baptize infants. They still have the church-state thing. And all of a sudden, I'm reading about John Calvin, who's a very, very great dear hero of mine. John Calvin, when these people come and say, wait a minute, you guys, you didn't go far enough. You need to have a regenerate church. You need to be baptizing believers. You need to, have, you need to separate from the state and not have the state tell you who the man is. John Calvin, I said... John Calvin would have kicked me out of, his, out of his country, out of his city. Because the Baptists begin. The Baptist principle, Baptists and Anabaptists, they begin to, to once again look at the Bible, take the Reformation all the way, and see that this is something that's real and true. And then in America, they come over in America, and all of a sudden in America, uh, uh, Americans start to become very, uh, they start off with all of these wonderful, rich Christian background, and then they become prosperous. They become rich. And then God brings an awakening, the first awakening, and then the second great awakening take place. And God sweeps this nation back to, to loving Christ and, and, and biblical churches and, and, the, and recapturing the biblical gospel. And then the enlightenment comes, and people become very, very liberal. Some theologians, some, some whole denominations become totally liberal. They no longer believe the Bible is the word of God. They no longer believe Jesus rose again from the dead. They no longer believe that salvation is by grace through faith. They no longer teach these things. And they begin to embrace all kinds of liberal uh, ideas into their church. And then God moves again. 
And you have fundamentalists and evangelicals who begin to come back to the Bible and preaching the Bible. And you know some of these names, Billy Graham and those people, they come back to the Bible. They start preaching the Bible. And then some in this circle begin to grab on, once again, to, to reform theology and begin to understand what a biblical church is. Now, all of that being said, down here in Maysville, some people start preaching Christ, preaching the gospel. And they call a pastor eventually, Clem Farmer, simple dairy farmer, but loves Christ, preaches Christ, preaches the gospel. And once again, what happens? New wine comes pouring in to this area here. And the Maysville Community Church gets started. And you see, dear friends, it's, it's a line. And then Crossroads Community Church, Crossroads Christian Fellowship, I mean, uh, springs out of that with a commitment to Christ, a commitment to the Bible, a commitment to the gospel. And so you see, we're a part of that whole string of people. Now, now let, let me just quickly transform, transfigure into my own personal story. My own personal story. I was brought up in a home that was nominally Christian in, 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 in many ways. Uh, some, 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 some real things. That, and, and eventually, very little church impact in my own life. And God saves me. And he saves me. He calls me. And I'm a high school student. And I'm in mainline evangelicalism. And as I'm growing in grace, and I'm active in mainline evangelicalism, I begin to see that it is, there's a shallow superficialness about evangelical Christianity. It's a man-centeredness and such. And I begin to experience a personal renewal in my own life by reading Jonathan Edwards, by reading Charles Spurgeon, by reading Martin Lloyd-Jones, by going back to these old fathers and, and grasping some of the rich, deep theology of them. And then I looked at the church, and the church was just dead with, with traditionalism and, and legalism and, and old structures, and it was resistant to the Bible. I was actually kicked out of two churches, dear friends. The first two churches that I pastored, I was kicked out of. And there was only one reason. I was kicked out of both of them. Number one, I'm an idiot, and I keep going back and getting myself you know, in these, in these places I shouldn't be. But number two, the primary reason was they didn't want to hear the Bible and live it out. And I kept a, 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 irritating everybody from the pulpit by preaching the Bible. And they didn't want that, so they kicked me out. Okay? So I, lost, I, I got kicked out of my first two churches. I'm struggling. What, what is church? What, what does this mean? I, I, I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. And then God opened the door and, and, and helped me to meet some other brethren who were the same place I were, but they were further along than me. And there was a renewal movement of going back to the Bible and exploring what does it mean to be a biblical church? What does it mean to have, what, who were the officers of, of the church? It was, it was elders and deacons. And what does it mean to be a church member? And what does it mean to function a church biblically? And what does it mean to take the Bible and do what the Bible says in the church? And this whole renewal movement, and this was so rich. And so when I came here, I brought all that God had been do doing to me. And honestly, dear friends, I want you to understand how special this place is. And I'm not saying we're better than anybody else. I just want you to understand how special what God has done in your life. You and I are in the stream of the Donatists, the Waldensians, and it begins with the apostles. The apostles, Jesus, the new wine, the apostles, biblical theology, biblical truth, biblical churchmanship, the Donatists, the Waldensians, John Huss, Whitcliffe, Martin Luther, Zwingli, John Calvin, the Baptists, the early awakeners, the, the evangelicals and, and such, you are part, Clem Farber and, 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 and such, you are part of that stream. Crossroads Christian Fellowship Church is part of that rich history, that stream, apostolic, biblical, baptistic, reformed. You are part of that stream. And that's why there's a richness here that you've experienced. And I want you to understand that. But I want you to understand something else. We fought not here in this church. Many battles were fought to get us to the place where we're at now. Many, many battles. What do I mean by that? Well, I've been a Christian somewhere around 50 years now, close to 50 years now. But I want to tell you something. There were great battles that were fought in my lifetime, and, and I had to wrestle with all of these things. And I'm just going to list some of them for you. The battle for the Bible. 
It was called the battle for the Bible. The Bible came under so much attack. It was no longer inspired of God, they, they were teaching. It was no longer inerrant. It was no longer has the authority. And, and, and all of a sudden, uh, the liberalism was overtaking. The battle was the, criticizing the Bible. It's full of contradictions. And the battle for the Bible raged. And I had the honor. There was a, the battle for the Bible is actually a book written by Harold Linzel. And I, I, I had the honor when I, was, when I got my seminary degree to walk across the stage. And Harold Linzel shook my hand and he said, one thing, we said it to all of them, but he said it to, but I, I was honored. And he said, preach the word, preach the word. And we fought the battle for the Bible. And so when the Bible was opened up and taught in this place and held as authoritative, dear friends, that was a huge battle. The battle for the lordship controversy. Jesus could be accepted as savior, but not as Lord. You could live a carnal Christian. You could live like the world, but still have Jesus as savior. And, and John MacArthur led this battle, but it was a battle that said, no, 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 no. The Bible says that when you come to Christ, you come all in. You come to him as Savior and Lord. You don't divide that up. And see, there was these whole huge battles of what is saving faith and what is real faith. And this idea of easy believism, that, that faith in Jesus was just a little ascension. These altar calls where all these people were coming and, and, and singing and that they were changed and then walking out and living just like the world and having the false assumption that they were saved. That was a huge battle. The battle of church order. What does it mean to be a church, a biblical church? Pragmatism was, was, was a traditionalism. We had to fight against that to get a biblical church with biblical eldership and such. The gospel of grace as opposed to legalism and the huge battles against fundamentalism to win the gospel back to be a gospel of grace without having people have it. And I want to tell you a battle that took place in that room right back there. We had four families. Four families years ago in this church that wanted to impose a form of legalism here. And they met with the elders here. And of all of those elders, one by one, were of one mind. But the one that sticks out to me was an older man that most of you don't know right now, but he's, he's, in, he's in heaven. And, uh, and this was Ray Shingler. And by the time we got to this point, we went around and asked every elder, those four families here, and they were, they were dug in and they were saying, you better do with this. This is what it means. And Ray Shingler said, I need to use a restroom. He got up. He was an old guy. He got up, walked to the restroom, came back. Okay. And this, this issue had to do with alcohol and the use of alcohol in Christians and things like that. And Ray had, you know, Ray had drunk. I think Ray was a teetotaler toddler at this point because of alcohol in his past. And, and Ray came walking in here, and he sat down. This old guy sat down at that table right there and looked these four families right in the eye and went like this. He hit the He said, this is an issue of the gospel, and we don't change. We don't impose legalism. And those four families, by the time that was over, walked out and never came back here again. But Ray was not willing to compromise the gospel. And see, these battles have been fought. Now, the battles of, of doctrinal depth, of superficial, man-centered Christianity, shallow preaching. We don't have it in this place. Complementarism. <coughs> Men and women, different yet equal, and complementing one another rather than what we have today. And now the battles that we face today, the reordering of sexual ethics, the attack on biblical morality, are we going to stand? And dear friends, there's a lot of soldiers here who have fought all of those battles. So let me conclude then by asking this question. How do we stay healthy? How do we stay a vibrant, healthy, new wine, flexible church? How do we do that? How, how do we, well, first of all, we stay away from the common causes. The common causes of churches becoming old wine skins that are inflexible and the new wine would just burst. Compromise with the world. Doctrinal decay. And a, a, a loss of our first love for Christ. A loss of the gospel. And the inflexibility of certain people, especially older folks, and I'm putting myself in that. You see, dear friends, churches sometimes age, and as they age and people get older, they become tradition-bound and inflexible. And that's part of what it means to be old. You like the things the same way you liked them in the past, all this new stuff you don't have any time for, and, and we become inflexible. And sometimes in church life, God brings young people into the church. God begins to save people. A new generation comes in, and they're different than the old generation. They relate differently. 
They like different music. They understand the context different. And churches struggle with this. And I'm going to introduce two words here. One is, one you'll know, but one you won't. The one you won't necessarily know is contextualization. Now, this word can be used in a very negative way in churches, but let me explain. Each generation has to take the eternal truths of the gospel and bring them to the context that they live in today in order to reach the generation that they live in today. The Amish are terrible at this. Uh, the Amish are wonderful, wonderful people. I love them. They're, they're wonderful people. We've got Amish people all over the place here. They're terrible at this. They, in fact, they don't do this. They say, we're not contextualizing. We're going to ride our horse and buggies, and we're going we're gonna to do this. We're, we're going we're gonna to live like it's the 18th century. That's what we're going to do. They, that's why they don't, nobody, very few people actually join the Amish. They just keep breeding. That's how you have more Amish people. But today, today, uh, if you were to, if, if you could picture the first, I'll tell you the first church that I attended. You know what I'd be like right now today? I'll tell you what I'd be like right now. I wouldn't have this beard. And I would be in a suit and tie. And so would all you men. Okay? And we would be singing these certain songs. And we'd have one little old piano player up here, really old, make, make Becky look like a spring chicken. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and that, was what, that was how you did church. And that's what you accepted. It was, it was inflexible. It never changed. Contextualization means, wait a minute, we need to, we need to be sensitive to our context. The, the, the danger of contextualization is compromise. Compromise where instead of preserving the gospel truths and preserving biblical truth and preserving the great doctrinal uh, battles that you want, you begin to compromise in order to be successful and to contextualize. And that's what the church is doing today. Let's not talk about sexual ethics. Let's not talk about gender issues. Let's not talk about the authority of scripture. Let's keep it all light and fun and friendly. Let's jettison those great doctrines. And that's compromising. You can't do that. The church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And so we need to contextualize and not compromise. And we need to be committed to change, contextual change, in with, of, uh, but never compromising the truth. And you'll see that's what we're committed to here as a church. That's why you're starting to see more young people uh, serving and worshiping and serving here and on our boards and things like that. We're, 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 we're committed to, to, to not being an old, inflexible, old people's church. We, we want to involve others. So let me, let me uh, exhort um, the older folks here than the younger folks. Let me exhort you older folks in light of all that we have seen here, in light of what God has done here, and in light of what Jesus has taught here. Let me exhort you older folks, be open, be flexible, have a vision, have a vision. Don't, don't be inflexible. Have more concern for the cause of Christ and his name than for your own comfort zones and your own tradition and the old contexts. Be open to this. And one of the greatest examples, just open your Bibles and read them. Listen to the old, radical, hardcore Pharisee, Paul. Galatians 5, 6 says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. I was reading that in my devotion. I said to Jan, what an incredible change this man made. Paul said, all of that old Phariseeism, I consider dumb that I might know Christ. I want Christ glorified. I don't care what hymns we sing. I want Christ glorified. I don't care how people dress. I want Christ honored and glorified. I want the gospel to go forth. I want it to be seen and powerfully moved. And that's why I want to encourage us older people here. Be flexible. We ain't going to be here that long. Be flexible. Be open. Be open and encourage older people. Encourage the young people. And if they come up here or they lead in a certain way or they're doing something and they do it even if they do it different than you, encourage them. Encourage them, welcome them, thank them, tell them, this church is not old wineskins. We're still new. We're still flexible. We're still ready. We want Christ to be glorified. We want Christ to be honored. We want Christ to be exalted. And if you can do that in a way that's different and better and, and contextualized better, so do it. To the old, younger people, let me say this. Number one, I ain't one of you. <laughs> I know you think I'm young, but I'm not. But I love you. I love you. And I feel like Simeon. 
Simeon in the Bible, when he, Jesus, they put Jesus in his hands, and old Simeon said, oh, Lord, you can take your servant now. I've seen your salvation. I feel like, Lord, the next generation, when I see all these young people here and all of you loving the Lord, getting baptized, serving him, I'm like, Lord, you can take me home now. The next generation is ready and launched and ready to go. I love you. I love you. I've been having the Psalms. In the Psalms, I've been reading uh, Psalm 145. One generation shall praise your works to another. And I thought, oh, praise God, that's happening at Crossroads. Praise God. Let me ex exhort you younger folks in two ways. Number one, take ownership. Step up. Have a passion for the Savior. Have a passion for his church. Get involved. Get active. Serve. Volunteer. Use your gifts. The church is, is God's central focus in the Savior. And this church is in long line with the Donatists, with people who bled and were, and were executed and slaughtered and burned at the stake, but, but loved the truth and loved the truth. And you have inherited that wonderful thing. Stand up. Stand up and take ownership of this church and get involved. We had a meeting uh, last week of the elders and deacons there, and uh, he's not here right now because he's probably babysitting, but Daniel Camp kind of was standing in the doorway of that meeting, okay? And I don't know why, I kept seeing Daniel, I'm like, what's Daniel doing here? And I, I want to, you know, I, I, I blew it at this point. I should have said, Daniel, I see you standing there. What do you have to say? But he was listening to the elders and deacons as we were wrestling through some things. And afterward, I walked out of the door, and Daniel was standing there wanting to talk to me. And he said, hey, Todd, he said, uh, I wanted to say this. And it was, he wanted to give some input about something that was being talked about, how he felt you know, that that was. And I said, oh, Daniel, I wish you would have done that. But my heart just thrilled. Here was a young man who was saying, this is my church. And we're moving forward. And I want to be a part of that. And I'm invested. And that's what I want to urge you, young people. Get involved and get involved and take ownership. Because we need you. We need you to help us contextualize. We need you to win the next generation. That's why we brought Chris onto the eldership. One of the reasons is, besides other things, we're biblically qualified and a godly and wonderful man. But Chris, you're younger than us. We often say in the eldership, what are you seeing from your generation? Help us to see it from your generation. We need to win each generation, each subculture. And that's why I want to urge you, young people, get involved, stay involved, be fervent, live your life for Christ. And dear young people, realize that once us old warriors are gone, is there going to be a biblical church here? Is there going to be a place where Christ is loved, where the gospel is preached? That's up to you. You should be very invested in this transition from old to young. Secondly, young people, please be humble, teachable, and patient. You're going to help us contextualize. We're going to help you not compromise. And there's a very important synergism there. We are here to help you not to jettison these important truths. Your strength is your youth. And youth have, vi have, have vision and dreamers and bold and ready to try new things. I'm watching Daniel single-handedly almost remodel this entire house. And I'm like, that would have been me 20 years ago. <laughs> that ain't me now. <laughs> I can't, the, the, the energy that, the, 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 that he brings, and that's what you bring to the church. You bring vision. But there's a weakness to that, and that you have to be very cautious of. And that weakness is, is that, and I've seen it when I was a young person, I see it now, you can focus on externals at times, something that's cool and hip, and that's really significant and external. And that's an external, that's not the major thing. You can love change for the sake of change. You can, you can, you can be mesmerized by anything that's radical and attractive. Let me tell you something stupid I did once as a radical, you know, breaking all the rules, evangelical hotshot. I was taken out to lunch in 1974 by the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Greenville. You know the church across from Fox's Pizza, the library, beautiful church building there. I was a member of that church. He took me to lunch. He saw a young, excited Christian. He took me to lunch. You know what I told him? I said, Pastor, let me give you some advice on how to run this church. <laughs> I think you should sell this building. Give the money to the poor. Start meeting in rented facilities, meeting in homes like the early church. What an idiot. <laughs> he, he, was, he was gracious. He was kind. He was loving. He probably smirked but inside. But 
But he, he appreciated my zeal. He appreciated my, but it was zeal without knowledge. What I'm saying to young people is be humble and be teachable. And remember, there are people here that have fought these battles. Matthew doesn't give the final line that Jesus gave in this discourse, but Luke does. In Luke 5, 39, listen to these words, how Jesus ended the wineskins discourse. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Now, Jesus is not saying here that the old traditions, the old Phariseeism is better, no. What he's saying here is, is that when in this whole process of new wines and new wineskins, the old wine, the uncompromised gospel, the truth of what God has done, that can't be dispensed with. And I want to urge you guys, take advantage of us old guys while we're still here. Take advantage of the battles. Learn. And between the two of us, let us move forward. God has been good to Crossroads Christian Fellowship. God has been very good to us. I think it says 1991. Does it say that out there, Chuck? What year was this church started? 80, 87. Since 1987 until now, God has been very good to this church. God has given us truth. God has given us light. God has been with us. God has been for us. God has poured new wine into us in the spirit. We're alive. We're fresh. We're healthy. We're vibrant. We're a good church. Let us be careful that when little Zelda is sitting right where Hannah is sitting, or even when little Zelda is a grandmother, little Danny is a grandfather, little Isaac is one of the oldest guys here, let us be careful that this church still loves Jesus. People still come in with open Bibles. This church has a passion for the lost. And on this hill, there is a bright light shining of gospel light that generation after generation after generation have brought people to Christ and has seen people saved. Dear young people who are in this church today, you need to be concerned that that's going to be the case. That when the Ray Shinglers are gone and the Todd Jossons are gone and forgot, forgot that Christ is loved. Christ is loved in this place. And we need to be about that, roll up our sleeves and be about that now, now. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask and we pray that you would take this place, this church, not this building per se, but this body of believers, and that you will help us to be a living temple of priesthood of believers, spirit-anointed, powerful, loving you, loving your gospel, uncompromised, and as the world is pressuring us more and more and more to compromise, to accept their vile, depraved ethics, to accept their, their ungodly perspectives, help us to be strong. Help us to be holy. Help this to be a bastion of health and strength and vibrancy, new wine, bubbling, healthy. And help us to be new and flexible wineskins. Give us grace. I pray for the... Older people here, help us to be open and, and, and flexible and, and willing to pass on the mantle and help the younger people, I pray, to step up and to be, ag and to be uh, aggressive in their, in their love of you and, 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 in, and in bringing life and new life and context to this church. Help us, we pray. Help us. Oh, Lord Jesus, when it's all said and done and we're all in heaven and our bodies are rotting in the grave, we just long that there will be a young generation here who doesn't even remember us, but loves you, opens their Bibles, and fearlessly does whatever you say. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I've gone a little long, and so let's be dismissed. Lord bless you.